Hello and welcome to the March 10th edition of the Bub Report. This week, we look back at a moment in history that opened the floodgates for hundreds of poor Grenadians, giving them the opportunity to pursue higher education, thanks to the kind contributions and solidarity of the Cuban government. In October of 1979, the first batch of Grenadian students journeyed to Cuba as part of the Grenada Revolution's thrust to empower its citizens with university degrees meant to shore up Grenada's future development. This year marks the 45th anniversary of the commencement of Grenada's academic and political relationship with Cuba. The 45th anniversary of the revolution also toppled Eric Gehry's regime on March 13th 1979. Also on the Bub Report, we deeply dive into Haiti's unfolding and unstable crisis. Earlier this week, Haiti's unelected government declared a 72-hour state of emergency after armed gang members stormed the Caribbean nation's two biggest prisons, freeing more than 4,700 inmates. In the country's capital, Port-au-Prince, corpses lie in neighborhoods and burning tires serve as roadblocks. Meanwhile, international players such as the United States urged Prime Minister Ariel Henry to resign. He visited Kenya last week to drum up military support for the beleaguered country. The latest deadly fighting between gangs and police is being led by gang leader Jimmy Cherizier, who issued a call to topple the unelected and largely absent government. The 46-year-old Cherizier, alias Barbecue, was formerly an officer of the Haitian National Police Force. As a police officer, he is alleged by the United Nations to have played a role in multiple massacres, including the killing of over 70 people in 2018, when over 400 homes in the capital's La Saline neighborhood were set on fire. Cherizier, originally from the Delmas area of Port-au-Prince, often making public appearances in a beret and camouflage, gun in hand, announced the creation in 2020 of a gang alliance. Meanwhile, the current chairman of CARICOM, Guyana's president Ifran Ali, declared on Thursday that the regional organization had not achieved any consensus between opposing parties in Haiti despite multiple meetings convened. Meanwhile, in a video broadcast by CARICOM, President Ali acknowledged the complexity of the situation in Haiti, exacerbated by the absence of vital functioning institutions such as the presidency and parliament, along with ongoing violence and a lack of humanitarian aid. We welcome our guests, diaspora-based Grenadian entrepreneur Ken Lewis, Sasha Filipova, senior staff attorney with the Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti, and Dr. Terence Marichaud, Grenadian physician and graduate of the University of Havana in Cuba. Here now is our host, Dr. Kellon Bubb, with this week's editorial titled, Women Under Threat from Misogyny, Rape and Gender-Based Violence in Grenada. We thank you for joining us. Hello everyone and welcome to this week's edition of the Bub Report. Now, as the world and certainly Grenada and the Caribbean hail the important and critical role women play in our societies on the occasion of International Women's Day, we can't help but acknowledge the continued threats that women face in Grenada and the region. The irony is not lost on us that while International Women's Day activities were being celebrated at the Grenada Trade Center, a young woman was killed at the hands of a male relative on the sister isle of Cariacou. A qualitative research study conducted by Deborah Joseph and Adele Jones of the Universities of the West Indies and Huddersfield in the UK respectively, observed that in the Caribbean, violence against women is acknowledged as being extensive. Their literature review points to widespread sexual, 
coercion and abuse. Even more alarming in their study was the data which revealed that five of the top 20 recorded rape rate, uh, rates for 2019 were in the Caribbean, with Grenada scoring the highest in the OECS. Now, what did Grenada record? Grenada recorded 30.6 rapes per 100,000 population. The recent murder of Kathy Brandel at the hands of three Grenadian fugitives, two of whom are now credibly accused of rape, causes us to critically reflect on the correlations between sexual violence and homicides. And that particular sad incident added another grim statistic to Grenada's staggering data in respect of rape. St. Kitts and Nevis recorded 28.6 per 100,000 people. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, 25.6 per 100,000 people. Barbados, 24.9, and Jamaica, 24.4. A survey of 1,079 women in Trinidad and Tobago in 2019 found that 30% of ever partnered women had experienced physical and or sexual violence, and 7% of all respondents indicated that they had been forced into sexual intercourse by a non-consensual partner. As elsewhere, the most prevalent form of violence against women in the Caribbean is that which occurs within the context of intimate relationships. And while legislation exists to protect women against the scourge of domestic violence, the implementation and regulation of these laws are largely ineffective and violence against women remains deeply entrenched into society. Now, Joseph and Jones makes the point further that it may be difficult to disentangle violence against women from the region's deep historical enslaved and colonial roots and the systematic emasculation of the Caribbean man that ensued in the process. If violence is examined and not only in terms of individual psychopathology, but by situating it within its social, economic, political, and historical context, it would be instructive to acknowledge that consequent, as a consequence of slavery and colonization, control and domination were the founding principles of Caribbean societies with status and privilege being reserved for men. In spite of these serious challenges, our women need to be reminded that they do epitomize resilience. Adversity serves not only as an obstacle, but as a catalyst for growth. Setbacks become stepping stones and failures are mere fuel for future triumphs. The juggling act of professional and personal obligations showcases women's extraordinary strength and unwavering dedication. Financially, but nowadays it's really very hard to find a job as a girl in Trinidad. You look around to find something to do, find a boss who promised to help you. But when the man laid down the condition, nothing else but humiliation. They want to see your whole anatomy, want to see what your doctor never see, want to do what your husband never do. Still, they know if these scams will hire you. Well, if it's all this humiliation to find a job these days as a woman. You could keep their money, I could keep my honey and die with my dignity.
Welcome to the very first segment of this week's edition of The Bub Report. Please remember to like and share this very important conversation on recent developments in Haiti that has the region glued to what's happening there. Now, many Latin American and Caribbean leaders often make grandiose declarations about regional solidarity. But when Haiti declared a state of emergency last week, as armed gangs took control of more than 80% of its capital, not one single major country in the region offered to help Haiti to restore order. In fact, very few Latin American presidents, save and except for the leaders of CARICOM, are saying anything about Haiti's takeover by gangs that are terrorizing the population and killing thousands of innocent citizens. Haiti's beleaguered and illegitimate prime minister, Ariel Henry, had to knock on the doors of African countries to ask them to send security forces to Haiti under a UN coordinated security plan. Prime Minister Henry traveled to Kenya last week to try to expedite a planned United Nations multinational security mission to the country. Now, under this plan, Kenya was to lead that force by sending close to 1,000 of its security forces to Haiti, and other countries will supply thousands more. But the deployment of Kenyan police agents to Haiti has been delayed by legal hurdles in Kenya. Other countries that have so far formally pledged security forces to the international force are Benin, Chad, Bangladesh, the Bahamas, and Barbados, according to the United Nations. The illegitimate Haitian government declared a state of emergency on Sunday after armed gangs broke into the country's largest high-security prison and freed thousands of inmates, further deteriorating the security situation. Last Monday, the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez, as well as the Secretary General of the OAS, Luis Almagro, called for urgent international help to avert a full takeover of the Haitian government by gangs. Now, more than 1,000 Haitians have been killed by gang members since January alone, amid a wave of indiscriminate murders, kidnappings, and violent robberies that continue to this day. Now, the Biden administration in the United States has also reportedly offered 200 million U.S. dollars to help fund the planned U.N. security mission. Now, Washington is reluctant to send its own forces in Haiti because of its checkered past in respect of the United States relationship, military relationship with Haiti that includes military interventions dating back from 1915 and ending in 1934, and subsequent military missions as well. Now, U.S. occupation of the country has made many Haitians suspicious of U.S. motives. So that is off the table. Now, while Brazil led a multinational peacekeeping force known as the U.N. Stabilization Mission in Haiti, or MINUSTA, for several years until 2017, neither Brazil nor any other major Latin American country is willing to take on that role today. Here to make sense of the ongoing crisis in Haiti is lawyer Sasha Filipova, who is a senior staff attorney with the Institute of Justice and Democracy for Haiti. Sasha and her institute focuses primarily on accountability for human rights violations, gender justice, including confronting sexual and gender-based violence and governance. Welcome to this week's edition of The Bub Report. Thanks very much for having me. I'm pleased to be here. Absolutely. Of course, uh, it's interesting that we're having this conversation this week, given that uh, this is also uh, the anniversary of, of the ouster of, of former mm -hmm. President uh, Jean Bertrand Aristide uh, uh, from from Haiti by the United States. 
uh, many decades ago. And of course, this this sort of brings back um, that history as well. So the, the irony is not lost on me that we're having this conversation. But let us currently talk, let us talk about what is happening uh, with this current state of play. How has this, how is this current crisis different from what obtained after the assassination of uh, the late President Moise? Well, so in some ways, I'm glad you brought up the two decades uh, anniversary from the um, from the coup staged with the help of the United States government against yes. democratically elected President Aristide, because in many ways, the current crisis has its roots directly in that form of foreign interference and was in play long before um, uh, at that point, uh, President Jovenel Moïse uh, was assassinated in July of 2021. Uh, but at that point, Moise had actually um, overstayed his presidential mandate to remain in office, and there was already a concerted civil society effort to come up with a transition back to a democracy, because just as I um, said, this crisis has its roots in the 2004 ouster of President um, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, um, the more direct antecedents to the present moment and Moise's capture of the state and the direct result in the current crisis um, was the U.S. supported uh, bringing into power of Martelly and his PHTK party in 2010 in the immediate aftermath of the devastating 2010 earthquake when the U.S. government forced what was a completely unfair election. And the set of actors over the past 12 years has completely captured the Haitian state deliberately dismantled um, institutions and mechanisms designed to promote democracy and accountability, and that uh, institutionalized impunity, um, use of armed groups for political violence against civil society actors who opposed um, the seizure of power and the rampant corruption that accompanied it um, are the direct causes of the, the present catastrophic violence that we're seeing in Haiti. Has, has there ever been has there ever been a, a historically symbiotic relationship between uh, the the political forces that you reference and the gangs? Because in 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 my understanding, and of course in my limited understanding, I should say, uh, of, of the politics of Haiti, uh, I, I've I've never heard gangs being so prominently featured. Um, has that always been the case? Sure, I, I think there's actually a long-standing history of um, repressive political actors using armed groups um, as essentially paramilitary forces in order to terrorize the Haitian population um, into submission for their authoritarian tendencies and the policies that they wanted to pursue, including rampant corruption. Um, so you saw, for example, the Tantan Makuts under the Duvalier dictatorships, and you see the direct antecedents to the current um, armed group violence. And it's it's a very complicated question of, of whether they're truly gangs or not. Um, but you saw see the direct antecedents, for example, in using armed groups to suppress the Petro Caribe Challengers movement um, that emerged in the wake of um, the the theft of billions of uh, aid money that um, Haiti received from Venezuela. Um, and the popular mobilization that followed was actively suppressed using these armed groups, including, for example, the November 2018 La Saline massacre, where you saw Jimmy Cherizier, who is a former police officer, working together with two government officials who have since been sanctioned and are therefore recognized. And this, this connection is well known, working together to essentially punish an area that was deeply involved in that kind of grassroots mobilizing to um, demand accountability and to confront corruption. And so Cherizier right now is one of the prominent leaders of one of the gang alliances that has been central to the current violence. Um, and so you see that direct through line between him and political actors. Of course, uh, you, you talk about that direct through line. Now, my understanding is that uh, Mr. Cherizier, which goes by the, uh, the, the, the sobriquet barbecue, uh, of course, we're going to talk about that. But uh, how did he go from uh, being a, a member of, of the, 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 the law enforcement national security establishment in Haiti uh, to a, a lawless and extremely notorious uh, gang leader? 
I think it's a great illustration of what, what I've sort of shorthand described as state capture. So as I said, starting in 2010, you saw a group of actors who were brought into power with support from the US government um, capture and dismantle state institutions to essentially enable continued control by these actors and their corruption. And they used paramilitary groups and they used their control of state institutions in order to do that. And so Cherizier, who starts out as a political, as a police officer, works in other ways, including with armed groups, to essentially pursue the agenda of these actors, namely to suppress Haitian opposition to that kind of state capture and control. Mm -hmm. And the chronic impunity, and we've been calling this out for years, calling for accountability for the La Saline massacre, naming the connection between the government and the perpetrators of that massacre, naming the fact of institutional capture and the corruption it embodies and the ways in which it has been undermining the the systems of democracy and accountability in Haiti. And yet the government of Haiti did nothing and international actors who were supporting those governments really didn't push on them in any way. And so we get to a moment where increasingly you see state institutions collapse one after the other. So at the time when Jovenel Moïse was assassinated, um, Haiti already no longer had a functional parliament. Only Moïse and 10 senators still remained as elected uh, officials in office. Um, and those 10 senators lacked the quorum to function as a Senate. So essentially they had no authority to exercise their democratic powers as checks and power on the executive. And what this describes is that um, the that state capture that I was describing, including through terrorizing civilians and civil society activists who were organizing against it, meant that you weren't holding elections. So parliament was defunct because um, under Moïse, no elections had been held. Um, and you saw with his assassination, a complete collapse of the constitutional order because none of the mechanisms that should have under Haiti's constitution enabled a peaceful transfer of power in the event of that kind of vacancy were available. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, um... The uh, as I said as I said in in, in the, the lead up to this conversation, uh, the president uh, uh, Ariel, the prime minister, he's out of the country now. Uh, so, and, and I I know that Haiti is supposed to have a president. It, there doesn't seem to be a president uh, now. It's the prime minister, um, and so a barbecue. Uh, th th this gang leader uh, is is now. Uh, letting the president or threatening that if the president returns to the country, that there is going to be uh, an all out civil war. But isn't the country already in a state of civil war? I don't know that it's accurate to describe Haiti as being in a state of civil war. Certainly there's enormous collapse and a level of violence that UN officials have said is on the order of uh, armed conflict, which is the kind of level that is associated with civil war. So I think the level of violence and conflict is certainly at that level, but you don't see that there aren't sort of political factions that are fighting one another the way you might see in a civil war. In state, instead, what you have happening is um, these armed groups have been empowered as paramilitary arms of actors who have captured the state, as I mentioned, essentially growing in power and metastasizing in a variety of ways. So the situation has gotten far more complicated um, as the state has collapsed. But the the reality is that Jimmy Cherizier does not represent um, some sort of actual political movement. He likes to present himself as a Robin Hood of sorts, who stands for some sort of popular mobilization of movement, but that he is very much not as a, he, At least the impression he gives is that he's a populist. <laughs> I get that uh, sense that he's a populist and, you know, he, he cares about the common man and, uh, you know, he cares I think for it's opportunistic framing to justify the violence that he is perpetrating against the Haitian okay. people. The kind of damage he is doing to civilian population, the kind of sexual violence we're seeing deployed as a tool of conflict and terror and control for populations. Um, those are not the actions of someone who cares about the Haitian people and is interested in um, establishing a stable democratic society that respects human rights. These are the actions of a bandit who is interested in power and control and has very complicated relationships to the people holding de facto power in Haiti 
um, was sort of sanctioned from various international actors. However, he is complicit in creating the situation. He has um, clear connections to the de facto government and has acted as a, at its behest at a variety of times, even if um, there are times when he at least publicly appears to be acting contrary to their interests. As I said, the, the landscape is very complicated in terms of how each of the actors is now vying for access to political and economic power, because unfortunately, the capture of the state has essentially destroyed the social compact of the state being accountable to the people of Haiti and to advancing their dignity and their rights, and has instead become a path to generating wealth and power for the few um, at the expense of the Haitian population. And that is what needs to be changed in order for Haiti to return to a stable democratic state. And how does that happen? Uh, because uh, th 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 there are several dynamics happening here. Uh, that perhaps did not exist before. We, we're not seeing, as, as we saw with, with the UN uh, peacekeeping mission that entered Haiti post that earthquake, uh, the, the appetite uh, for having uh, international involvement or even regional involvement at the CARICOM level uh, seems to be extremely low. And, 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 and in the, the absence of, again, civil society institutions, in the absence of... Uh, uh, a functioning state, <laughs> you know, you have prisoners on the loose. I mean, it, it, this this really speaks to anarchy. So where where does Haiti go from here? Sure. So Haiti does have a vibrant civil society who have been fighting incredibly hard to restore Haiti's institutions to the Haitian people and who've shown incredible leadership in the space. The problem is that international actors, including my own United States government, has essentially been picking winners and losers and installing and propping up actors who have done the work of capturing the Haitian state, hollowing out its institutions and enabling these armed actors. So what Haitian civil society who we work with and partner with say, um, and what we strongly support is that they need the US government and other international actors to stop propping up the actors responsible for the current crisis and to give them space to come up with a Haitian solution to the crisis. And Haiti is endlessly capable of doing this. The history of Haiti is the history of the improbable coming together of the Haitian people in order to secure their own liberty and their own well-being. And you saw this with the successful Haitian revolution, which defeated Napoleon Bonaparte uh, and the French empire in order to create the first republic of free black people um, rising up from enslavement. And you saw this when the Haitian people mobilized um, under a brutal dictatorship of the Duvaliers, who were, by the way, supported by the United States, even as they committed gross human rights abuses, and the Haitians mobilized um, and uh, overthrew the dictatorship and um, really put together a flourishing democracy that brought to power um, President Aristide in an incredibly uh, popularly supported election. Um, and then he was undermined by international actors and um, the coup, as, as you invoked, happened, um, the second coup against him actually, but with US support happened two decades ago. And it was, you know, yet another cycle of international actors really dictating to Haitians who their leaders should be and enabling actors who use those spaces in order to deprive the Haitian people of their rights. And so what is needed right now is for Haitians to have space to choose their own path forward without foreign interference. And then once they come up with what they consider to be the appropriate transitional path, and there have been many efforts towards this that have been stymied by international actors, then um, there can be a viable path to stability because Haitian civil society has opposed the notion of this intervention in part because it has been requested by an illegitimate de facto government and on reason ability to return to the country right now um, is just the embodiment of the ways in which he has never held legitimate power in Haiti and was in fact installed by international actors and kept in place there over significant opposition by the Haitian people. Um, but Haitian civil society has said that an intervention requested by him with 
all of the same actors in place who, by the way, are credibly linked to the armed groups. And that's why I think the police has really struggled to control them because there's consistent evidence of the fact that the police is infiltrated by these armed groups and the leadership is complicit in the role of armed groups in taking over Haiti. Um, so you can't fix it if those are the same people in power. And so bringing in an intervention against this institutional capture, um, Haitian civil society views as completely pointless. And what they've asked is for international actors to give them space to determine their path forward, to come up with a transitional government, and from there to chart a, p a path back to stability. And I I'm glad you mentioned international actors because uh, the, the framing, uh, and I call it a respectability politics framing, and then we'll go over for some closing comments. There is a respectability politics framing in the context of uh, many English-speaking Caribbean countries, including Grenada's, that uh, uh, Haiti has brought that on themselves. Uh, you know, they're responsible for this. You know, and 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 we tend in the English-speaking Caribbean, in particular, and perhaps also the Dominican Republic. I'm sure uh, Haiti's neighbors, and of course, we know what's happening on the border there in respect of them beefing up security there. But that respectability politics framing uh, sees Haiti as this pity case. And, and it never frames the, 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 uh, what's happening there in the context of that international interventionist uh, 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 framing that, that you talk about. Can you expand on um, the role, especially of, 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 of the United States uh, over time, historically, in, in, in being responsible for uh, the inter nissan conflicts that we continue to see in Haiti? Um, that is such a great question, and thank you for, for asking it in exactly the way that you did, because yes. the history of Haiti is the history of rob robbery, essentially, by foreign actors of a place that is incredibly rich in people, in, in nature, in resources, in potential. Um, and the challenges that Haiti faces are the direct product of that kind of foreign action. And sort of one incredibly tangible embodiment of this fact is that after the Haitian people freed themselves from enslavement and colonial rule, um, France sent a number of warships to uh, blockade Haiti and essentially extorted a payment from Haiti of what France called reparations for its lost property, which incidentally included the value of human lives of the people who had just freed themselves from one of the most horrific examples of chattel slavery in the world. Um, and by the way, the U.S. government enabled all of this because the U.S. government refused to recognize Haiti actually much past this point, even though a number of freed Haitians fought for the independence of the United States. Um, but as a slave owning country at the time, the U.S. really um, really stood against Haiti. And so France extorted a debt that wasn't fully paid off until the middle of the 20th century. So as France was building its Eiffel Tower, Haitians were paying it incredible amounts of money. And um, reporting and analysis of that debt shows that it amounted to $21 billion after what was some really predatory financing, including by French and US financial institutions. Um, and they also calculate that the loss of development in Haiti's institutions and in its um, in its people was well over a hundred billion dollars in today's money. So all of that money that could have gone to building education, healthcare system, sanitation system, to um, empowering the Haitian people to live dignified lives was going into. France's coffers and the coffers of international institutions. And that that creates the current challenges that Haiti faces. And interestingly, there's an, another anniversary coming up on Sunday of um, former President Bill Clinton actually issuing a formal apology for the role the United States more recently played in decimating Haiti's food sovereignty by um, structuring U.S. rice exports in a way that essentially undermined Haiti's own ability to produce its food. And one of the hallmarks of the present crisis is that Haitians are starving. More than 4 million Haitians lack adequate food and are at crisis levels of hunger. Um, and that's directly linked to policies by the United States to 
impede Haitian sovereignty with respect to producing its own food. And then, you know, with respect to government, of course, coups against the democratically elected government um, under Jean Bertrand Aristide and subsequent actions to install and prop up in power a series of leaders who disregarded their obligations to the Haitian people and instead pursued policies that favored international actors has resulted in institutions that do not vindicate the rights of Haitians and are instead oriented towards enabling corruption of people who look to the US and other international actors for being able to stay in power. Th thank you for that uh, very thorough and very nuanced uh, articulation there. Uh, how are your civil society partners doing on the ground, though, uh, 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 under these circumstances? It's been really hard. I think one of the products of the dynamics of state capture and institutionalized impunity and corruption is that the space for civil society has been shrinking. So, for example, even before the assassination of Jovenel Mois, we saw a series of assassinations of civil society leaders, for example, constitutional law scholar Monfrey Derval, um, human rights uh, leaders and journalists like uh, uh, Nnedi um, uh, Duclair and um, so many others, all of that with total impunity. And so the space for organizing has been really restricted and any number of civil society leaders have had to flee the country, both as a matter of baseline insecurity, but also as a consequence of being deliberately targeted. Um, so it's hard, but in spite of this, um, we see Haitian civil society show up to deliver services, for example, that the de facto government has failed to deliver and also to mobilize. And I think to illustrate why Haitian civil society says, and, and we uplift the analysis that in order for there to be a successful exit from this crisis. The first step is for international actors to stop propping up the actors responsible, mm -hmm. is that in 2021, well before the assassination of Jovenel Moïse, you saw this unprecedented coming together of a broad variety, a broad range of Haitian civil society actors in order to come up with a solution to what they already perceived as the crisis, a crisis of governance and democratic collapse. All the antecedents of the present acute insecurity were already there. And it was uh, prompted in part by Jovenel Moïse overstaying his presidential mandate in office, as I mentioned. And so they came together to identify a path forward for a uh, democratic transition that would address some of the institutional capture and collapse um, such that it would be possible to hold elections that are free and fair. And so they released a, a proposed agreement for that path forward that envisioned a two-year timeline for effectuating this transition and, and culminating in elections. They released it in August of 2021, so a month after Jovenel Moïse was assassinated, but the product of months of work at this point and an incredible coming together of Haitian civil society. And that agreement was ignored by international actors. Henri, who at that point had been installed in office by essentially a tweet by the core group, which is a group of foreign actors particularly interested in Haiti and led by the United States, um, installed Henri, and Henri released a purported agreement um, in September, so a month after Montana, um, that would essentially institutionalize the status quo, but called it a path to transition. And the United States essentially endorsed this agreement and ignored Montana. And months later, the, at the time, U.S. Special Envoy to Haiti actually resigned in part because of the um, situation at the border where Haitians were being you know, whipped from horseback by U.S. Border Patrol, the Del Rio situation, but also in part, and he called this out very explicitly because the U.S. government was engaged in what he called yet another instance of international puppeteering by disregarding an earlier in time more participatory Haitian civil society effort in favor of this pseudo agreement put forward by Henri. And the December agreement that is currently, you know, being 
lauded by, although perhaps less so in the moment, but had been lauded by the United States, by the UN, was essentially version 2.0 of the September agreement put out a little a year later after some of the international press attention had gone away from, from this dynamic. And so all of this going to show that where Haitian civil society does the incredibly hard work of mobilizing in this incredibly dangerous and fraught space and puts together a proposed agreement that, that articulates a viable path forward, they have been diminished and disregarded and really undermined by international act actions. And so you can't expect to see a solution until and unless there's space for it. And for there to be space, this requires the U.S. government in particular, but international actors more generally, to commit to giving Haitians the space to lead and to make their own decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, such important framing uh, as, as, as an independent uh, media entity. This is the kinds of framing that we need uh, to understand and, 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 and the nuances around this conflict, because it is not as simplistic as... Uh, to the Grenadian audience, uh, what you see from international media. And that is why we have a, a, an expert uh, such as uh, Attorney Philip over here. Uh, attorney, any final words from you before we go to the next segment? Just to say that, you know, to the point you made earlier, Haiti has so many times been called, you know, the, the consistent moniker of poorest country in the Western Hemisphere and has been pitied for the ways in which Haitians have supposedly failed. And as we talked about, Haitians have in fact succeeded against immense odds over and over again, and have been really ill served by um, international actors who purport to be partners, even as they um, steal and steal from Haitians and undermine their, their liberty and their right to self-determination. And I think Haiti represents the ultimate call to freedom. It, it, it is owed a great debt by the rest of the world for really confronting the, the practice of slavery um, and for um, shaping our modern human rights order. And I think it should be treated with respect and solidarity by other actors and especially by others in the region. And I, I, I really hope and I, I really ask everyone who watches your show to stand in solidarity with the Haitian people to recognize this dynamic that fundamentally reflects structural racism and fundamentally reflects um, neo-colonialist tendencies by some of these actors. And I ask that you stand in solidarity with Haitians and call on your governments to really push on behalf of Haitian civil society to have the space to um, chart their own path and identify a path forward without interference from, from foreign actors. Mm -hmm. uh, Sasha, uh, attorney Sasha Philippa, thank you so much for appearing on this week's edition of The Bub Report. Uh, we like to say here we would continue to watch the space, uh, but this is a very important space with uh, not only domestic implications for Haiti, but regional and uh, 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 na international implications uh, in respect of issues like immigration, in respect of uh, uh, if, if you have an unstable society, you will have mass migration. And so th there is this moral scare around, oh, the immigrants, the immigrants, the immigrants. Why are the immigrants coming in the first place? So, so thank you for providing this very important and valuable context this week. Thank you so much for having me and for your attention to this topic. Absolutely. Uh, viewers and listeners, uh, that was uh, uh, lawyer Sasha Filipova, a senior staff attorney with the Institute for Justice and Democracy for Haiti, an organization that works with civil society organizations on the ground in Haiti. And she was able to give us, give us an update in respect of the ongoing uh, uh, political and security situation in Haiti that has everyone's attention right now uh, in the region glued to what these particular events uh, would uh, turn out to look like. Viewers and listeners, stay tuned. We would come back for the second segment of this week's edition of The Bub Report. Thanks for staying with us. Should your loved ones pass on, they deserve to be treated with dignity. And at S.A. Johnson Funeral Home, we can provide you with that service. We can take you every step of the way during your sorrowful moments. When that need arises, call S.A. Johnson Funeral Home 
at 347-777-9797. That's 347-777-9797. S.A. Johnson Funeral Home is a Caribbean family-owned funeral home here in Brooklyn, providing funeral services, but in a dignified way. From cremation to burial to the repatriation of your loved ones, you don't have to go through the hassle as we provide exceptional service that allows you to mourn and heal peacefully. For more information, visit our website, www.sajohnsonfuneral.org. Send us an email at sajfuneral at aol.com or call 347-777-9797. S.A. Johnson Funeral Home, because you deserve to be treated with dignity. Cuba is a country of many contradictions. While many of its citizens live on less than 50 US cents a day, the Cuban communist government continues to expend most of its capital and human resources in spite of the crippling American trade embargo and offering free tertiary education to thousands of students from the developing world. I had the opportunity while in Cuba to sit with students from Grenada the only other island in the Caribbean to have had a communist-style revolution. Daryl Isaac and Molina Modest are both medical students at the Latin American University in Havana. I say that the, the education here is a lot more hands-on, a lot more um, practical, and the one in issue is a lot, of, a lot more theoretical. That's perfect, but both of them would have their benefits in the future. But well, the um, difference here, I guess, is a manner in which they teach you Spanish again. The way in which they teach you the um, different stuff is the way they, in which they approach the system. Because Cuba still follows a morphology, here, a morphology system, where they take all the subjects and they make a, a combination of subjects, trying to create the link in between the subjects at, at the, in the same time. But the system in which I studied in back home was you study the subject separately and then you make your own links through your studies. Both of them would have their benefits because when you study them separately, you get uh, you, you, um, you study more in depth, which is amazing. But here, I guess, seeing the links one time help you with the, um, the memory process, the memorizing process. Mm -hmm. Cuba is very different from the culture of Grenada, starting with the food, there is a lot of starchy food like the rice. It's almost every day you eat rice. And then there is difficulties with communication. We are used to internet back home or just picking up the phone and call whoever you want to speak to. But here in Cuba, it's very different. Um, also, there is a lot of adjustment with living with different people from all over the world, with different culture, different religion, different beliefs, different um, ways of doing things and so on so sometimes it's challenging but then I, my advice to anybody that is coming to Cuba to study is to always come with an open mind because when you come to Cuba it's very very different and everybody adjusts differently so when you come with an open mind it's easier for you to adjust easily. The students were candid about the conditions under which they study. Well during this last two years um, I always say I don't know if my brother and my mother sense when I'm stressed because they always call me around those times. So I have to thank my family, my immediate, my, especially my brother and my mother, because they always know the right time to call. It may be right before an exam where I feel flustered or feel like I, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, this semester has been way too long. And the phone rings and my mother is just like, hey, you, you, know, you know what to do. Everybody's experience is different. Sometimes how you might adjust to something, I might not be able to adjust to that. So it's good to always come with an open mind so then it's easier for you because if you don't adjust, but the quicker you adjust, it's easier for you to study easier. There's a lot of things to, to, to face here and with time, you're gonna make it because as my mother always say too, there are a lot of people that was before me and the time was even harder and it made it. Many Cubans boast about their medical diplomacy and are quick to point out that unlike their geographical adversaries in the north, their nearest neighbor, their main export happens to be humanitarian goodwill and not military terror. 
Reporting from Havana, this is Kellen Bubb. And viewers and listeners, welcome back to this week's edition of uh, the Bub Report. Now, you may wonder, you may be wondering why we actually play this video. We play this video, as we said in the TN, because we are celebrating uh, 45 years of Cuba's educational contribution to Grenada that started with the Grenada Revolution back in 1979. Of course, this is the 45th year of that legacy. Now, before the revolution, very few working class Grenadian citizens studied abroad, but that drastically changed in October 1979 when the first 109 young Grenadians left the country to study on scholarships in the Republic of Cuba. This week, we are joined by two pioneering Grenadians who studied in Cuba during that era as Grenada observes the 45th anniversary of its second revolution the Socialist Revolution of Maurice Bishop and the New Drill Movement. But I'm happy uh, now, viewers and listeners, to be joined by two legacies of that period. He is Mr. Ken Lewis, who is an alumnus of the Universidad de Oriente, uh, and he studied economics uh, at that university, which is in the south of Cuba. He graduated in 1989. He's part of the class of 1989. And we are also joined by Dr. Terence Marischal, who studied medicine at the University of Havana. He graduated from that institution in 1986. Uh, Dr. Marischal and Mr. Lewis, welcome to this week's edition of the Bub Report. Thank, Thank you, you. Kellen. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. And of course, this, this is a capstone year, another capstone year for the Grenada Revolution. It is 45 years, 45 years uh, in respect of that revolution. Now, while the revolution is fraught with many controversial issues, I believe one of the enduring legacies of the revolution is how education was able to catapult many working class Grenadian students into the middle class. Would you agree that Cuba played a significant role in that process, gentlemen? Uh, I would say un undoubtedly. Yes. Because, you know, in the Gary era and, and Prior to that, the only real opportunity you had to go abroad and study was if you got an island scholarship. There was just one real scholarship in those days. And if your parents were wealthy enough and you, you probably um, had family living in the States, okay, so you might get an opportunity to go to the United States and maybe find your way once you got there. But from a local point of view, there were hardly any scholarships available. It would be the odd Commonwealth scholarship kind of thing and the island scholar. And these were given really, you know, to people who a lot of times were supporters of the, 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 the ruling party at the time. But when the revel came, it changed all of that. And immediately, with just the stroke of a, a pen, you know, with the, the coming into being of the revolution, you had dozens of scholarships being created in, in, the, in the four years, uh, four and a half years of, of the revolution, and mainly for the sons and daughters of working people, people who ordinarily would not have had the economic means to send their children to university. Or in some cases, they would have had to go to the bank and get a big loan and, and incur a lot of costs and debt in trying to educate their children. Mm -hmm. And so the education that we got in Cuba was virtually free. Free, when I, when I tell you free, it, can't, it couldn't be more free than that, up to the point where they gave you books, they gave you clothes, but in addition to housing and, and feeding you, mm -hmm. they gave you clothes on a regular basis, they gave you books, and they gave you even a stipend on a monthly basis so that you can buy things outside of the, the norms of the, the university. You know, if you were tired of the, the kind of food that you're you getting on a regular basis um, and you wanted something different, you had enough money that you could go outside and shop in the markets and, and that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. the greatest part of it is that on completion of your, your education as well, you are debt free. 
not as you know many students in the United States who are burdened with, with debt for years and years and years after yeah. they have graduated. We never had even well into their retirement. <laughs> even well into their retirement, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. so that was a revolution in and of itself. The fact that mm -hmm. so many of us were able to, to go abroad and study and didn't have to worry, and our parents didn't have to worry about really, you know, any great expenses as far as our education was concerned. Maybe the only expenses they would have had was if they wanted us home on vacation, that kind of thing. Although some people opted to stay in Cuba and, and, and not come home, but only kind, the only kinds of expenses you'd have had to incur was those kinds of expenses for going home on vacation. And uh, Mr. Lewis, let me bring you in here. Uh, you know, we talk about that, uh, the, the ability of, 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 of the, the Grenada Revolution with its partners in Cuba to catapult a generation of Grenadians into uh, middle-class life. I mean, uh, you know, I, I hear anecdotal stories in respect of how how proud uh, Grenadian working-class parents were who never had an opportunity to attend yep. secondary school, right? That sense of pride that they had when, you know, they knew that, you know, the, their sons and daughters had this opportunity that they never imagined possible. You know, I hear anecdotal stories like that. People crying um, it's been with tears of joy during that time when that first batch of students went on went off to study in Cuba. They uh, couldn't believe that that was the case. You got to understand, um, Kellon. My grandmother was born, I think, in early 1900s, yes. and she knew people that were born in slavery. So it was not that long ago. Uh, and Terry made the point in 1978. You had three scholarships. And by 1982, there were 300, over 300 Grenadians from working class families studying in Cuba, in Germany, in places like that. So it was really significant change. And you can see them today. When you look at the professionals in Grenada, many of them have worked two in the Caribbean region. Many of them studied, studied um, in Cuba. And so I think that was really significant change for us and for many of the other Caribbean territories. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now one of the, one of the observations I, I made and uh, when I interviewed a former ambassador, Clara Charles in Cuba, and, and she made the point that a country with so little was able to contribute so much uh, to Grenada's educational legacy. Dr. Marshall, can you reflect on that? The fact that uh, Cuba, still has, up to today, this crippling embargo uh, uh, against it, uh, you know, this punishing embargo that punishes its citizens. You're talking about a country that uh, uh, struggles with uh, 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 obtaining basic material, but they still were able to provide that kind of support uh, for uh, Grenada's nascent revolution. Well, th that speaks to the kind of country that Cuba really and truly is. And one thing I say almost always when I attend a solidarity meeting and I speak about Cuba, is that if there were more countries like Cuba in this world, what a wonderful world this would be. Uh -huh. Because when you consider a country like Cuba that has so many difficulties, no country in the history of the world has had to suffer the indignities of an embargo that is so harsh that even the basic necessities, even something like toilet paper sometimes is in scarce, um, you know, is in scarce demand. Something as, as, as simple as that. But when you also quantify the cost for an education in the United States that Cuba gives for free to not only Grenadian students, but students throughout the Caribbean, students throughout Africa, and all over the world, because when we studied in Cuba, it was like an international scenario for us, because we studied with people from all over the world, from Madagascar, from Mali, from South Africa, from wherever. Cuba was providing assistance to these people. And it boggles the mind to understand how a country that is so small, that has scarce resources, the world you know, is not a 
that rich country by any stretch of the imagination. And has had to suffer 60 years of an economic blockade and embargo that has crippled them in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And they're still able to help people in the way that they've helped all of us. You can only have nothing but admiration for the Cuban people and the sacrifices that they have been able to make on behalf of the people of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. When you consider in monetary terms, in real monetary terms and quantified, you, you run into millions and millions of dollars that Cuba expends in, in keeping us safe. And, and let me make that point too, that we have never had to worry about our safety in Cuba. We never had to worry about running from guns um, or, or getting shot, as you see on, on American media all the time. Mass shootings. We, 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 like, walked, we yeah. walked the, the streets of Cuba day and night and never body, no, no one has ever mugged us. Nobody has ever threatened us. In fact, once they knew we, we were from Grenada, we are always welcomed and treated but, but I would even say priority in, in a sense because they always remember Bishop and they say, Bishop, Bishop, Bishop. And they would embrace us and, and, and treat us in, in, in a very special way. We visited homes of all kinds of people and they always embraced us and welcomed us because we came from, from, from Grenada. And so besides just being a country that just helps you economically and provides the education, the warmth and the friendship and the, and, and the, the way they, they treat you make you feel so at home that you never had to worry about anything, really. You know, I mean, in my time, I, I can tell you that there were very little worries in terms of, um, you know, our safety, in terms of anything else, but to just dedicate yourself to your studies because everything else was provided for you. And only a country like Cuba has been able to do that in, in, in our lifetime. I, I don't know about any other country, um, whether it's in the region or otherwise. Not even the richest countries in the world have been able to provide the kind of assistance that they have provided for us, for our own development. Because what they give us is permanent. They can't, nobody can't take that away from you. You get an education and you decide what you want to go and do with it. And one thing I can say about the Cuban graduates is that the majority of us have returned and have served the country. In fact, almost every institution in Cuba of, of, of any note, whether it's at the governmental level or otherwise, you can find Cuban graduates manning those positions at the head of those positions and continue to serve as they have done from the time we returned in 1986 uh, until the present, whether it is in politics, whether it is in economics, whether it is in teaching, whether it is in dentistry, in medicine, mm -hmm. veterinary medicine. You can just name them. And I can tell you that is the largest of the revolution because if you, were going to, if you were to remove all of that, try to, to imagine a Grenada with all, without all of these professionals that have returned to serve the, the country in the last um, 30 odd years. Mm -hmm. And uh, can, uh, same question. If, yeah, you wanted to add something. Go ahead. I was just adding. It's a yes. benefit that remains from the revolution. So even if it was just four and a half years, it's a lasting legacy. A legacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, is so that is so critical, Ken, you, you speak of this legacy, uh, but let us, let us go back in, in, in time, uh, shall we? And uh, in, in, in the nascent days of the Grenada Revolution, in, in, in that first year, of course, uh, the first uh, group of students, as I understand it, went off to study in, in 1979. I believe it, it might have been. Yes, uh, of, and I'm one of, I'm of, one of those. And, and you're one of those from that first batch, right? That, that very, very <laughs> first batch. Uh, so, so talk to us about that initial, I mean, the revolution is still very young at that point. You're talking, it's not even a year old yet. And, 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 and the revolutionary leaders, it would appear as if they hit the ground running <laughs> from March to October to, to have, what was it? What was about, what was it about that vision for education that uh, the revolutionary leadership saw that they felt that, you know what, Cuba would be, uh, a, a, a very important and attractive option uh, to, to, to offer uh, educational services to Grenadians? I would say, first of all, the whole fact that, aside from all of the myths and misconceptions that people had about Cuba, mm -hmm. one thing people always knew about Cuba was its prowess in education, health, and sport, because, you know, it was a time when Juan Torino and all these kind of people 
were, were, um, were famous. Mm -hmm. But if nothing else, we, we knew that. And then with the establishment of relations between Grenada and Cuba in those early days, and the offer from Cuba of scholarships to train Grenadian students, the revolutionary government jumped at it. And it was probably the, the one of the best things they, they ever did because as Ken mentioned, well over 300 students um, by 1982 had been studying in, in Cuba. Of course, initially, there would have been a lot of apprehension, a little bit of curiosity of Cuba because, you know, most of the propaganda and information that we heard about Cuba is about always something negative, something that, you know, like the things like they eat babies in Cuba, and, and those are the kinds of things you see. Babies? That, yeah, yeah those, I mean, that's the kind of adverse propaganda you, you used to hear about Cuba, you yeah. know? This communist country that, you know, kill people and, you know, is not a good country to go to. And a lot of us would have gone to Cuba, you know, a little bit nervous, wondering what to expect um, in the early days. But in, in very short order, as we got there and we saw for ourselves, you know, the, the welcoming experience that we had from the Cuban people. And within a few weeks, beginning to live among the Cuban people and understanding them and realizing that everything that they told us were lies. Just they were just lies. blatant lies, you know. Mm -hmm. And what a lovely, you know, humane kind of people that they, they, they were, you know. And you began to speak to them and you began to learn from their experiences and they learn from, from us and you, you, you want to learn the Spanish and you, you're just interacting with them. And it was just a, a wonderful experience. I'm telling you, it, I, I wouldn't trade that experience for the world. If well, I had to do it all over again, I, I, I would do it in a heartbeat because yeah. it was nothing as, as I expected. In fact, I had an opportunity to see the both sides of the coin because yes. just prior to, to going to Cuba, I'd already lived in the United States and went to school in the United States as well. So I just completed that degree in the United States and had that kind of experience. And then to go to Cuba and get the other side of the coin, not knowing what Cuba was like and, you know, just going in, in a way that, you know, with an open mind and seeing what, what it was, I can tell you I enjoyed that experience much more than I enjoyed the experience um, in the United States studying in, in Cuba. It was just a wonderful experience uh, for me. Yeah, uh, Ken? Remember, Cuba had helped the Michael Manley government in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And so there were, a lot, there were a lot of negatives about Cuba that was, that was spread throughout the region. So I remember the Gleaner once had a headline, something like, um, Gastro kills five babies. But they made the G very much like a C. So a play on a, a play on Castro, <laughs> babies, and there was just propaganda like this. I'm going on, so there was a lot of apprehension when people went to Cuba, and especially um, when you when you arrive in a place and it's culturally different. Your first impression is, oh, this different because you know the cops were different, you know things like that, and but people adjusted and got to love it. And as Terry said, I mean, I can't repeat more. What M. Terry said, totally incorrect. We all had our Cuban families, which we were able to go to when you come off the university, if you want. Mm -hmm. It was really great. Mm -hmm. Now, let us talk about this pushback. Did you get any pushback from your parents? Uh, your, were your parents on board? I, I, I'm sure some of them were excited uh, by the prospect that their children would be doing better than they did uh, professionally and academically. Uh, but were there any parents who said, you know, uh, I'm not going to send my child to a communist country? <laughs> did, did, what, what, was that existing at that time as well? I think there were two pressures. Um, yeah. The first pressure was that, like I said, very few people going to universities, as Terry mentioned. So there was this pressure where, no, your kid can get an education, of course, and it's free, so why not take it? But at the same time, they were worried, especially for their daughters and so on. Should I, you know, that, that kind of thing. But after Terry and so opened them the door on the first batch of, of students, you know, um, that was it. By then, the scholarships came and everyone... I remember, in fact, 
The second batch, I should have gone, but because I was working in the West Indian at the time, they didn't want, they told me I would, I would go later. But I remember the amount of crowding in the ministry for those scholarships. So by the mm -hmm. second year, it really opened up and everybody realized that no one happened, nothing happened, nothing happened to the test bunch and Terry and so I mean, were fine. So if the guinea pigs were okay, everyone can now go. Dr. Marshall, yes. On vacations as well, we had the opportunity to come yeah. back home. In fact, yes. the, the first year, the first exactly. year we came back home was really an experience in and of itself because mm -hmm. There was this cargo boat that was coming back to Grenada um, in, 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 19, in 1980. Mm -hmm. And so many of us who wanted to come home but didn't have the means to come home decided that we were going to jump on this boat and, ah. and, and, and get that ride home. So we, we had that experience where, you know, they provided mattresses for us and we slept right on the deck. There were some uh, mornings when we were going through a squall and you just had to get up and, and fold that mattress quickly and, and get it, you know, into some area where, where, where it wouldn't get wet so that you can use it again. Mm -hmm. And we were, many of us, right under the chimney. So at the end of the day, you were just black from soot, you know, <laughs> just from the, the, the smoke and soot that was coming out of, out of, out of that um, chimney, you know. But... It was an experience in and of itself. We we came home and landed safely, and our parents were, were, were happy to see us. And then you now that interaction with you know the the, the revolution at the time, this nascent revolution, uh, the young people wanted to know how that experience was. In fact, uh, I was invited to to address a, a youth group when 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 I went home uh, for the first time, and. Even to speak to members of the military because I went as as part of the military. I was actually sent by the military to become one of the doctors for the military. And so when I went back, I was able to speak to some of them. And once they knew that everything was fine and that we came back safe and sound, and we were able to ex um, relay some of our experiences to to all of them, then people felt a little bit more comfortable. And and as Ken mentioned. By the next year, people were lining up, trying to get scholarships to go to Cuba. And by the next year, again, even more lining up for, for, for that experience because it turned out to be really for us a, a wonderful experience. How long did that journey take on that boat? I, I, I just imagine, for example, just going down to Trinidad, the journey through the Bocas in and of itself. I remember getting on a boat for, for that ride one time and th that felt like eons. <laughs> I just can't it, imagine. It, it took us about a week. A week, yeah. About a week, a little over a week. Yeah, yeah. Th uh, that 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 is a fascinating story. Now let us stop. Let's get down to brass tacks and talk about the university experience. Of course, uh, in in my time when I visited Cuba, I, I what really surprised me was, and again and again, you know, you 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 talk about this Western media propagandic lens, propagandistic lens that uh, you know it's just like you know. The, the way that they, they frame Africa is everyone, you know, sleeping in huts and swinging on trees, that type of thing. And I remember when I went to Cuba, I was just really surprised, pleasantly surprised by the, the, the extent of international students in the country. I was really surprised by that. And, you know, and, and so let us talk about, and can I, I would begin with you with this question. Let us talk about that academic and professional development experience that you had at the Cuban University. Set the scene for us. What did that look like? Cuban University was great. Great um, professors from Germany, from Russia, from Cuba. But that was not all. Mm -hmm. It was the experience you got from people. So I went to school with people who were coming back from Zimbabwe, people who had been in the bush fighting and they were studying with us from Angola. There were Palestinians who had been bombed when they were young and are now here telling us about uh, I mean, the experiences. And today, because of the internet, I still can connect with some of them, with many of, with many of the Africans. I, when I visited South Africa, I was able to visit I mean, some of them. So it's really great. And many have done, many have done very well as, 
as um, Terry mentioned. But I think that out, that other experience in Cuba was just as valuable as the academic as the academic education because you could hear you no know, firsthand stories from the people who were there in almost mm -hmm. in almost every place around the world so that was in itself remarkable and and you were of course in in, in the southern part of cuba universidad de oriente was that in um, the, the the santiago region of cuba yes man the best part of cuba i could tell you that <laughs> I see Terry, uh, Dr. Marichu is smiling here. But, but, but let us talk about Santiago because I do understand uh, uh, that Santiago is, shall we say, the chocolate side of Cuba in many respects. It's, yes. it, it has that very rich Afrocentric orientation. Talk to me about uh, being there and um, um, that experience you had with, with, with Afro-Cubans. First of all, you're 23 in a place that's very hot. It's yes. um, it's much hotter than than the northern part of, mm. of Cuba, and of course, a lot of people that look like you culture. You can see we went to um, Santeria stuff. You, you know, people still practice that there because they African um, um lineage and so on. So it so Santiago was really great, and in a sense, it's my adopted home, m my second. You know, in terms in terms of that but um and the music and the big bands you know from that part of cuba was also great and and because the way the way cuba is many things are accessible so it's not like to go to a show you have to pay big money you know i'm a reverse in the park and everyone can go so Growing up in Cuba, I think, and being in and being in Santiago especially was really great for me. And uh, Dr. Marisho, of course, you were in uh, cosmopolitan Havana, cosmopolitan. shall we say? Yep. <laughs> and of course, you know, Havana is, is such a, a historic city as well, uh, very international. And again, that's the thing that 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 I wish people appreciated how international. Cuba is, especially exactly. in respect of its global South orientation, which I really appreciated. So talk to me about your experience in, uh, uh, did, did you uh, visit, or, or what was it, the, the Tropicana? I think that's what it was called. Oh, of course, of course. You, you, yeah. can't, you can't go to Cuba without visiting Tropicana. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I mean, in the first case, when we just went to Cuba, we stayed in a, a sort of rural village um, to the east of Havana called Machurukutu. That, that's where we did our uh, first year of studying Spanish and, you know, getting oriented into the whole Cuban educational system and preparing us to go into university in the next year. So it was a beautiful experience living also in, in that rural area because, again, you got to interact with the, with the villagers and really simple people. And the group of us, well, we spent a lot of time exercising, and just exploring generally, you know, I remember once mm -hmm. we found this herb on the side of the road and, and people said, wow, look what we just found, some sugar dish. <laughs> 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 well, you know that from the time they found sugar dish, that was it, guys were making sugar dish tea all the time, you know. <laughs> now, this is the rural side, but then afterwards yeah. when we moved to Havana you know, to begin our real studies, um, you can't get more international than that, more mm -hmm. cosmopolitan than that. The high-rise buildings, you know, to visit what is called Havana Libre, the big hotel mm -hmm. um, in, in the middle of Havana that was um, acquired by, by the Cubans um, after the revolution. And, you know, just living in, in a, a city that was, the, you know, for the first time, that, well, I lived in New York, so I know what a city life is all about. But... Living in Cuba now and, and seeing how the people interact with each other and seeing all of these different foreigners and then in, in school, you, you, as, as Ken was mentioning, all of these different nationalities, whether they were Palestinians, whether they were Colombians, I mean, I've developed relationships with so many people. Um, the Jamaicans in particular, the, the Caribbean people, we had something special because we always met and, and interacted with each other in, in, in many ways. In fact, okay. one of the things that we used to do as Grenadians is that we had this, this festival every year. 
Mm. And a lot of the songs and so that you would have heard being portrayed during our independence celebrations this year, all of the folk songs, the Grenadian group, all of us, we knew all of those songs. And every year we, we used to have this competition among faculties, you know, or different mm -hmm. schools where we put on um, a, a show, for example, and, and we'd rehearse, we spent a lot of time rehearsing all of these folk songs and, and so on. And invite everybody to, to, to come, at, to come and, 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 and listen to us, um, you know, participate in, 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 in these cultural activities. So we showcased our culture as well, our own culture, and, and, and people enjoyed it, you know. And then we got to learn about the experiences of the, the same people like the Palestinians. You know, we learned about the, the, the Colombians and, the, you know, the problems that they had with the rebels in, in Colombia and, and, and all of that. And you develop this sense of solidarity in Cuba with the struggles of other people. You begin to understand, you know, that we are not isolated. We are, the struggles of of Grenada intertwined with the struggles of people from all over the world, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we got to interact with a lot of Africans in particular, mm -hmm. from uh, Madagascar, from Mali, from uh, South Africa, Botswana. All, all of these countries, they were, they were present in Cuba um, in one form or another, studying and or, or living in Cuba, you know. And so that interaction with people and that experience really opened up your eyes and to, to, to a lot. And in, in my case in particular, I had probably one of the more unique experiences and Ken will tell you that, you know, after the collapse of the revolution, then I had to travel all over the world to, to represent youth and students while studying. So mm -hmm. it, it opened up some, some avenues to me that I, I never knew was possible because I had to attend, for example, um, preparatory meetings for the World Festival of Youth and Students in Moscow. And, you know, I was just whisked away sometimes from from my studies. You know, the the, the union of, of communist youth, the leaders would just come and say, "Marisho boy, you have to travel next week." <laughs> just like that, and I had no choice. I just had to just get my stuff together and just join them, and and you know, fly to Moscow or fly to to Germany or to Czechoslovakia or West, you know West Germany or bulgaria or hungary I, I mean during my 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 part of the experience was, was unique i must say that um because of, of you know what took place at the revolution not the last probably i would not have had that experience but because of what happened then i was thrown into into a spotlight where um i was expected to do a, a lot of these these were responsibilities that were trust on me because we didn't have embassies we didn't have um an ambassador at the time, so I had to pretty much handle all of the affairs of students from 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 that time until I left in 1986. So, in essence, you were a student leader in that way as well. Right, they were an elected yeah. student leader because all of the students came together after the collapse of the revolution and elect me as the, the um, leader of the students. So right. I was like an unofficial ambassador in a sense because everything that a student needed, any problems a student had, had to be channeled through me. And then I would make representation for them to the Cuban authorities. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that was my job during that time while trying to concentrate on studying and getting a medical degree. So I, I, I just can't imagine how intense that was. <laughs> no, but, you know, when, when I look back yeah. on the experience, it, it, you know, it, it boggles my mind that, you know, I was able to do all of it. But yeah. um, again, I, I wouldn't trade it for the world because the experience in itself really made me what I am today as a person. Mm -hmm. And and can uh, Dr. Marshall talks about this, uh, th this solidarity there and, and uh, th that was so critical, especially at, at, in, in you gentlemen studied at a time uh, that geopolitical tensions in the world were extremely rife. So that solidarity was extremely special. Yes, of course. Um, the people, the former was he former? I, he did. When I went back to Cuba years ago, the ambassador of South Africa was someone I studied with. Mm -hmm. And so he had called me and told me to visit. And so when I went, the, you know, with all the guards and everything, and he saw me, he just forgot all the protocol, ran out and we hugs and, you know, that you develop such closeness with 
people there, you know. So yeah. that was that was really unique. And in a sense, you were a Grenadian student, but you were really a foreign student. And everyone mixed, be it you know, Zambian, wherever. And so now with the internet, the great thing is that there were people we didn't hear about for 20 years. And then when the internet opened up, you found them on Facebook, you started communicating again. And so now we have WhatsApp and chat group with a few of them and, you know, that sort of thing. So it has been a really great experience. I mean, the minister, the former minister of finance in Suriname was my bunk mate and we studied together and things like that. So it's, yeah, was a really yeah. great experience. Still is. And, and still is. And of course, you know, and, and we talk about these great legacies, but, but, but in my uh, understanding of, of the post-revolutionary period, as, as was the case in the pre-revolutionary period, uh, Grenadian uh, Cuban graduates who returned to Grenada, as I understand it, experienced pushback uh, in respect of um, what you, you, you were willing to contribute uh, to uh, your own country. Can you kind of reflect on, on the pushback you received from the immediate post-revolutionary uh, uh, establishment in St. George's? Well, I, I can speak to that very eloquently because yeah. I've been a, a victim of it in a sense. Mm -hmm. One of the first things I did when the revolution um, collapsed and I was elected as leader of the students was to write the government of Grenada who was recalling us. They wanted all of us to come back home. Mm -hmm. And we said, you know, we met among ourselves and we decided, okay, well, no, that, that, that's not a, a, a feasible option for us because you're being recalled and without any options in terms of whether we're going to be able to continue studying, where are we going to be studying and anything like that. So we decided we, we're going to complete our studies and we so informed the government that we, we that this is what we are going to do. Mm -hmm. Just before we returned home in '86, so of course there was a, a batch that that returned in '85. The first group returned in '85. These were the people, for example, the dentists and so and other people in university uh, university courses, which would have had a one year difference less than 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 the medical students. I also wrote the government informing them that uh, our students were beginning to return and that they hope that we hope that they would treat us in the same way as the, the, the revolutionary government would have treated us because we are sent on government scholarships mm -hmm. and we are willing and ready to return to provide our services to Korean people just as we had promised the revolutionary government. When the medical students returned home, the, den the dental students already had the experience of being absorbed into 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 the system, and they had some help with people like like Dr. Strode and so on, who, who lobbied for them because there was a scarcity of dentists in, in the country. When the dentist when the doctors were returning, now I did the same thing. I, I I wrote a Blaze government informing them that we were returning home and that we were willing and ready to serve in the same capacity as as before. Of course, when we returned home, the all kinds of obstacles put in our way. They weren't accepting our credentials. They said we were not um, well qualified and they had to contact the University of the West Indies to determine whether we were well qualified or not. But UE informed them that the Cuban degree is a very recognized degree all over the world and they had no problem with it. So that was the first obstacle we had to overcome. Then the medical students um, we had to sit and, and, and wait for a while while government, de government deliberated because they said they didn't have the, the space and, and, the, and the money to, to absorb us. And after a while, they did inform us that they were, they were going to provide five spaces. There were 10 of us at a time. Five spaces on a first come, first serve basis. Now, uh, we, we, uh, I in particular and, and many of us found that unacceptable. Because how are you going to determine who are the first five to go in or not? You know, we couldn't decide. I mean, they, they didn't put like academic criteria, like maybe your academic index or whatever it is. But at any rate, five spaces and then what to the other five? I was at the time counseling people that what we should do is just have a common denominator. Let them license all of us. 
because we had already done internship in Cuba. So they gave all of us license. Then who wanted to go and work with government could have won and work with government. The five who wanted to go, they could have taken the five spaces. But at least the other five would have had that option to go into private practice and survive, you know, through private practice. But the government said, no, we're not going to give you your license until you serve a period of internship again. And this time, not one year of internship, but two. Two years of internship. So it meant that compared to other doctors all over the world who would have done one year of internship, we would have had to do three years of internship, the one year they already did in Cuba, and two more being imposed by the Grenadian government. Now, I, I, again, and I counseled and, and said that, you know, we, 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 we can't accept this, you know. But of course, with that carrot and stick being waved in front of us, the weaker ones among us decided that they were going to take it. So one person took it, and then another one took it, and then the rest of the group said one from 10 is not like how the um, Eric Williams said after um, Jamaica Federation. Promoted. Federation. <laughs> and so they left us just, just hanging. E eventually, um, everybody was absorbed, you know, months later. And I was not going to be among the first to, to go. I wanted everybody to go in because I was the leader of the students. And when my turn came, um, well, just before my turn came, actually, I, I went to New York and I was invited to, um, to address a meeting in Medgar Evers, which I, I did during the, the years from 1983 until 86, from the time the revolution collapsed until 86. Anytime I went to the States, I was always invited to, um, to you know, do a little address or something like that, because people already began to know me as a, as a student leader or a youth leader. So I, I did that and I went to New York to you know continue my residence status kind of thing. And I went into the ministry and told them I was traveling to New York and that when my, my turn came, they could contact me. In any case, I came back mm -hmm. um, after a period in the United States. And when I came back and I showed up for my, my appointment, they refused to, 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 to give me one. They said that, um, they sent me a letter saying that my, my entry into the pre-registration internship program was revoked because of recent developments. So I said, like, oh, what are these developments? You know, what, what is it, you know? Well, they never told me anything. They just told me that was it. I took my case to a uh, good friend, Leslie Pierre at the time, who, you know, was anti-Cuba, anti-us, everything. But he still ran my, he still my, ran my story. Um, and I could still remember the caption, Marishal left out in the cold. That was, that was, that was the, the headline mm -hmm. uh, on the back of the, um, the, 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 the Canadian voice. The Canadian yes. voice paper at the time. Mm -hmm. So the Minister of Health at the time was Danny Williams. So I went to him and I said, Mr. Williams, I mean, what, what are these recent developments? He's asking me if I can tell him what are those recent developments. I said, no. I said, you, you took everybody in on the basis of their qualifications. I have the same qualifications and you have to take me in on the basis of those qualifications as well. Mm -hmm. It was only after Leslie Pierre contacted him and asked him, well, or you could take everybody in and leave my show out. He said, well, because I attended a meeting in New York in which I was critical of the government and that my attitude was not in keeping with one that desired to work with the same government. At a time when the democracy was supposed to have returned to Grenada, eh? you made a criticized revolution, it's not democratic, you can't talk. And I, I talk and I criticize all of the obstacles that they were putting in our way and I, I internationalized it. And I spoke about it because there was no need for it. And because of that, my right to work, a right enshrined in the Constitution, was taken away from me for four years, from 1986 to 1990. But even that, so, that yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. But 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 even so, uh, you, 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 every Grenadian is also entitled to that constitutionally guaranteed free speech right, and, exactly. and so one ought not to be denied any opportunities because of your exercise of that particular constitutional right. Precisely. <laughs> yeah. Precisely. Yeah. But, but we, that, that experience, though, paved the way for the rest who came, because after that struggle, it meant that, um, you know, those who came after from 1987 and beyond got that recognition because of the, the struggles that, 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 that we fought. Mm -hmm. And then we still had another struggle to fight because we had to remove 
that discrimination against Grenadian doctors who are to serve two more years uh, of internship rather than one which professionals from uh, from other, other islands or other countries would have had to serve if they had to serve in Grenada. Mm -hmm. One year of internship. So I remember in, in 1990, when, when I finally got my rights back and I returned to the General Hospital now to, to begin my internship uh, program, we agitated again and actually shut the hospital down, the junior doctors. For the first time in the history of Grenada, I had to take action like that where we went on strike and shut hospital services down except for essential services. With that demand in particular, that they remove that two-year internship stipulation and make it one for everybody across the board. And that was another struggle that we fought and won mm -hmm. after I got into that hospital. So everybody now serves one and that's it. But that mm -hmm. paved the way for everybody else now after that to serve one year of internship and then get their license. Mm -hmm. The funny, uh, the, can, can, go ahead. Part of the, the funny thing is that while Grenada was discriminating against Cuban graduates and trying to, you know, as though Cuba was something out of this world, you know, when I went to City College to do my master's and I was very apprehensive because I had studied in Cuba and I see how we were treated, I'm in Grenada. When I went and I presented where I studied, the, the guy in the bursary looked at me like, you know, why am I, you know, so hesitant, you know? And I remember him coming outside and looking at City College. And he said, doesn't, it, doesn't this look like the University of Havana? And I said, yeah. <laughs> yes, it looks, it looks the same. And he said, well, it was the same architect. Oh. You understand? He said it was actually. And so basically what I'm saying is that while we were making this big problem in Grenada, in the U.S., supposedly Cuba's adversary had no problem with that. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I never knew that part of the story, the, the fact that uh, in, in, in the, the, the buildup to Grenadian studying in Cuba, you had all of these prejudices against Cuba. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, having returned, having returned with your professional qualifications, which I'm sure the country needed and still needs, especially exactly. in respect of uh, the, the, the public health care infrastructure of the country. And uh, you, you were treated in this way. It's, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, 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 it's insane to me that that actually happened. But, but it's, it's good that we are, we, we are laying this on the table. Gentlemen, uh, you, you, you folks can write an entire set of books, oh, yes. I'm sure, <laughs> on, 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 your uh, on your experience in Cuba. There are two final questions uh, before we get to the next segment. One has to do with the, the, the long-lasting relational uh, the, the bonds that, you know, we had Grenadians getting married to, to Cubans, having Cuban wives, <laughs> you know, and, and, and uh, you know, Grenadian wives having Cuban husbands and things like that. Uh, did any of you, uh, uh, shall we say, sold your wild oats while you were there in Cuba? Do you have uh, uh, Cuban roots? <laughs> Well, my yeah. wife studied in Cuba. My wife studied in Matanzas. And she's Grenadian, but studied in Matanzas at the in time. Matanzas, okay. Dr. Marichal? Well, again, unique experience. <laughs> yes. The first one to get married to a Cuban um, <laughs> lady in, in, in Cuba. And the first one to actually have a child in Cuba. Uh, okay, my, my, my first daughter, Tamara, was born in Cuba, and I married a, a Cuban lady, Marta. And we, she moved to Grenada after some years because uh, she was also a medical student. Mm -hmm. So she graduated as, as a medical doctor, became part of the family doctor program in Cuba, mm -hmm. and later on joined me. And my, uh, I'm in Grenada with my, with my uh, she and my daughter joined me in Grenada. Mm -hmm. And she became yeah. an integral part of the, the Grenadian health, healthcare system as well. She worked for, for many years until um, her, her recent um, re retirement. Yes. But she worked in Grenada before me. <laughs> <laughs> 
actually got accepted and worked in in my own country before I got before my right. Did. And, and and considering how much you struggled. <laughs> exactly. Right. And um we, we, we bought uh, three children, two of whom are um are medical doctors today too. Mm-hmm. And um my, my my last one um started on the road to, to medicine, but I, I don't think he, he, he liked medicine, so he graduated at a pre-med degree in biological sciences from FIU. And also just recently, this is his love, I think, more computers and so, so he just completed another degree right. in IT at mm-hmm. the St. George's University. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I have three Cuban Grenadian children, if you want to call it that. And well, um, ex-Cuban wife. Yeah, yeah. No, the, 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 this is a, th- these are beautiful stories, you know, it, uh, and again, it goes back to that, that solidarity, uh, uh, that camaraderie that uh, we had with Cuba and still continue to have with Cuba. The Caribbean still continue to, continues uh, to have with Cuba. Now, I, I want to end on, on a very important note, and, and, and this is for Grenadians, especially Grenadians in the diaspora, uh, who visit Cuba all the time. And I do remember, and I shared this with, with, with Brother Ken, uh, that the, the very first time, and I'm going to put uh, Sister Clara Charles on the spot now, I remember the very first time that uh, travel was open between uh, the United States and Cuba under the Obama administration. We had to get some kind of permission, but because uh, I work in the field of journalism, uh, it was easy for me to get a, a permission to travel to Cuba uh, with the help of of, of uh, former Ambassador Clara Charles. And I remember Ambassador Clara Charles saying this to me. She said, I'm giving you this letter, but in return, you must bring school supplies for the Maurice Bishop School in Cuba. And I'm saying, what are you talking about? A Maurice Bishop School in Cuba? I never knew there was a Maurice Bishop School in Cuba until uh, Sister Clara Charles indicated that there was a Maurice Bishop School in Cuba. And so she impressed upon me at the time, if you're coming to Cuba, please bring school supplies to the Maurice Bishop School in Cuba. And I'm saying all of this to say, gentlemen, that another point that Mrs. Charles, Ms. Charles made also was that a country that is under such uh, 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 an oppressive embargo, a country that has uh, that struggles to manage its very limited resources, is still able to give as much as it is giving. The least we can do as as people who benefited from Cuba in some way is to give back. So uh, let us close on how we as uh, people of the Caribbean who have benefited, uh, I I have friends and relatives who have benefited from Cuba medically, who go to Cuba. You know, you talk about the medical missions, you talk about uh, the eye missions that come to Grenada, you talk about the Cuban doctors, who come to Grenada, which I think is one of Cuba's greatest exports. How can we as as a Grenadian people give back and and, and contribute uh, to Cuba's uh, continued uh, growth and development? Well, that was a a mouthful. (laughs) Yes, I mean, you mentioned the the school, for example, and it's really a school for, for handicapped children. So it bears the name of a, a national hero. It bears the name of one of, uh, of as, as far as I'm concerned, our, our greatest prime minister. Mm-hmm. And, you know, even just a small contribution from time to time to, towards that school is, is something that is well appreciated um, by, by the school and by the, the, the people. In these times where Cuba is going through a very, very difficult time, um, economically and otherwise, if from time to time we can raise, you know, the, the, the transport that, that, that we, we can access to, to take things to Cuba. So if we can from time to time raise funds and, you know, just help to keep even some of, the, some of the students, you know, instead of having them to rely on the Cuban um, resources, that we try our best to keep our own students um, by sending, you know, uh, bars. I think recently, the ambassador from um, the Grenier ambassador to, to Cuba contacted me um, about uh, sending uh, the, a group of uh, parents who are organizing barriers to send to Cuba and they had 
contacted um, the embassy and some form of transport was made available to them to get some resources and barriers to the students over there. So those are the kinds of things we can do um, on, on a regular basis. And we don't have to wait until Cuba has a disaster to help Cuba. You know, knowing that they have scarce resources at this time, knowing that they, they, they're under an embargo, they can hardly do business with, with other countries because of, again, the extraterritorial provisions of the embargo, and also because they have been placed on this list of state sponsors of terrorism. They can hardly do, do much um, by way of buying or selling anything, you know, to the United States or even to, to other countries because of the, the provisions of that embargo, which prohibit third countries from doing business with Cuba. So sometimes you have to just defy the, the, the so-called law because that law um, of the United States, if you go to, to take it on, you, you, you'll be so scared to do anything that, you know, you, you just sit there and do nothing. But we also have to recognize the voice of the people in the United Nations and the overwhelming majority of people of the United Nations who have said in no uncertain manner, year after year, when that resolution against the blockade comes up, have voted overwhelmingly in favor of, of the, the lifting of the blockade against Cuba, with only two countries um, against it, which would be the United States and, and Israel, which, as far as I'm concerned, are one and the same country. So that a voice, as far as that is concerned, must be made um, heard every time so that we will know that, you know, we, we, we're not giving up that struggle to have it lifted. And even though the United States doesn't really bother and doesn't listen to to, to, to the voices of um, the, the rest of the world as it relates to this particular question, which mm -hmm. is really an insult to the rest of the world who have been speaking for so many years for, for the lift of, of that embargo. Well, you have to continue that. You have to continue that struggle again for the people to have the territory returned to them. Guantanamo Bay, it belongs to the Cuban people, and we have to continue stressing that, you know, through international fora and through our governments, that they need to return Cuba's territory to them. And whatever way we can help economically, as I said, to, to send from time to time, you know, um, barrels of whether it's food or, or just basic supplies, sanitary supplies, whatever it is, the things that are in really scarce um supply in cuba that we you know whenever there, there's a possibility i remember recently we, we made a drive after one of the hurricanes to, to, to send things to cuba it, it sat in the airport for a long long time because of, of some problem with um, with the transport for, for months and months and months and we had collected quite a bit of uh, material you know my, my my clinic was even used as a hub for that and every so often the ambassador would, would come and, and pick it up but we have to make, continue to make those drives. You don't have to wait until there is a particular crisis, like a hurricane or anything like that. There's an ongoing hurricane, which is the blockade. And we need to continue to help them as much as we can. And I will tell you, for me personally, one of my biggest disappointments is the attitude of our own Cuban graduates towards Cuba. And I, I think Ken would agree with me too, that you know that attitude has not been the most forthcoming attitude in, 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 in the past. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see a, a lot more being done. I'd like to see more of our, our graduates come forward and show that gratitude to Cuba for what they have done for us. Um, I think that is that is very, very lacking um, in our society still. We, we praise Cuba and we, we have that degree and we, we, we make money uh, off of that and, and we, we have good lives and, and what have you because it, it has helped all of us. Yeah. If you go through the society, there, 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 there are a few graduates from Cuba who are not living a decent lifestyle, thanks to Cuba. And I think the, the, the most we can do, or the least we can do, is to give a little back whenever we call upon to do so. A lot of times we don't do it, but yeah. the least we can do is to give back a little. I think, I think many have given back to probably individual families, to friends they have in Cuba. But I think you need to have it far more organized. Yes, yes. Now that we have this movement here, you know, graduados and the Cuba, that we could really start to organize it better. Because part of the problem, too, has been organization. So the very blockade and difficulty to get things into Cuba has been put in the way. So, for instance, you can't send a Western Union. I was trying to... Yes. 
you, but to send a Western Union, the states in Grenada, it's blocked. So I have to get someone that's going into Cuba to yeah. give money personally. So it yeah. is a bit difficult, but it's a lot we can do. And I want to make a second and just just one last point on that. Mm -hmm. One of the last things I remember when I was leaving Cuba and I asked how we can help. One of the things one of my professors told me, he says, whatever we give you, help others. So I think we should continue with the solidarity we saw in Cuba. And in a sense, this is why I still work in cooperatives. This is why I still work in the working class movement and with drivers in the US and so on. I think people just continue to wherever you are, give the gratitude you saw in Cuba. But I agree with you, Terry, we really should try to do more for the Cubans themselves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and that is a point that uh, former Ambassador Clary Charles made and several ambassadors before her, I think it's, it's a clarion call, you know, uh, that first of all, the education was given to you for free. You are not saddled with debt. I mean, yeah. where does that happen in any kind of industrial <laughs> exactly. life? <laughs> Ken? <laughs> By the way, they even provided entertainment. In other words, besides us giving you bakers and all of that, there were bus tours. They would give us in the vacation period. Remember, Terry? Yes, would... yes. The same, the same Tropicana you talked about. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. They, yeah. they, they took us to Tropicana and provided one of the most beautiful music I'd ever get in Tropicana. Oh, and yes. and, and uh, the, 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 that spectacle under the stars is something that is unforgettable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, Cuba no, no. It's just a Cuba wonderful was... place. We people don't realize yeah, Cuba... what a wonderful place that is. And such a it's not just that, 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 that little opening, that little opening under the Obama period. Yes. Everything began to flourish again, you know. Everything yes, just 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 in, in in just one single year with the cruise ships going in, all the flights yeah. going in. And yeah. and it just as just that you could can you imagine if they just lifted that blockade, what kind of country yeah. that would be? Like yeah. the whole I mean, of <laughs> like all of Brooklyn went in that one year. Everyone, yes, yes. I, well, I, I was one of those people that. Was... <laughs> and that is that is what they saw, and they decided, uh, uh this country is just progressing too fast in just this little time that we opened it. Let us just clamp down everything again. And then when the Trump, the Trump administration came in, he decided, uh, uh I'm going to outdo yeah. um, Obama by just shutting down everything. And and, yeah. and and not just shut it down. They, they they adopted some 227 new measures against the people, people you know, against for, for nothing, for absolutely nothing. And the last thing he did just before he went out was to name them on that list. That was like almost the, the nail in the coffin. It's, it's, it's like a, 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 a death knell at that point. Yeah, a, a, yeah. of terrorism, yeah. you know, which really yeah. made mm -hmm. it a hundred yeah. times more difficult for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 that is why it's even more critical for. For, 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 for those of us who uh, benefited from that type of education, that, that type of service, uh, give back. I, I believe in gratitude. Gratitude is a must, you know. Uh, gentlemen, this was such a, 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 a riveting and beautiful conversation, uh, and, and I'm sure it brought back lots of memories for you. I learned a lot. I'm sure the audience learned a lot. So thank you all for appearing on this week's edition of The Bub Report. Okay, thank you, Kalan. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. For Absolutely. Hi everyone. Thanks for checking out the Bub Report's social media pages. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch our weekly live show, follow our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram pages, and also subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can catch repeat episodes on Wednesdays at 4 and 5 p.m. respectively on CRFM Radio and GBN TV in Grenada. We are also viewed on Sundays at 8 p.m. on WPG10 throughout the Caribbean. Thanks for watching. Viewers and listeners, we're happy that you can join us for this week's edition of The Bub Report. Please join us next week for another installment. On behalf of the producers of this program, I'm your humble host, Dr. Kellen Bubb, wishing everyone a pleasant week. Take care now. Bye-bye.